Major Calvin Ferris didn't let the unusual sounds of the alien jungle rile him. Even the blood-curdling screech of the female covat. It looked like an oversized grasshopper with a tiny head but sounded like a child screaming in pain through a loudspeaker. The way the sound echoed off the trees made locating it difficult, but not overly so. A risky proposal for attracting a mate, as it just as soon attracted any number of predators. Ferris found the covat and closed it up in a bag, silencing it. Someone hold on to this, he said. I got it, sir. Mbeba took the bag from him and tied it to her combat harness. Thanks, Mbeba. Ferris looked at the eight-person team, one officer plus seven NCOs, all trained for every kind of environment Earth could throw at them. This wasn't Earth, though, and as the first humans to set foot on this planet, they were still learning their way around. How far to the outpost, you reckon? Carter's broad Australian accent was unmissable, even when he spoke silently as now. Outpost is fourteen clicks towards those mountains. Ferris looked the overmap display in his HUD. Stupid shifting poles, that's 32 degrees right now. Mbeba pulled up her notes in her HUD. That's a shift of 14 degrees in the last 30 hours. Sorry, ladies. And gents still haven't decrypted their navigation satellite signals, Bowen said. But I know how to tune into them now. Perhaps, Orlovska said, we should focus on first taking a scout party. See what tech and intel we can get from them. Maybe they have Xeno GPS, Tuck. Ferris nodded. She didn't talk much, but when she did, she had good ideas. That sounds like a plan. As it stands, though, we need to get our asses in the vicinity of the outpost before dark. As they trekked through the jungle, Ferris thought about his team. Prior to boarding the ship, they had never met. They all, however, had their orders, and his was to lead the team. In order to do so, he'd learned everything he could about them on the trip, and they all learned about the other's service history, ranks, accomplishments, and more important things like favorite booze. The team consisted of Major Calvin Ferris, U.S. Army, Essefod Delta, Chief Petty Officer Angela Baber, U.S. Navy SEAL, Sergeant Oliver Carter, Australian Army, SAS, Warrant Officer 2 Jennifer Bowen, U.K. Royal Navy, SBS, Mlodzi Korazi Maja Orlowska, Polish Army, Grom, Rav Samal Noam Gutman, Israeli Defense Force, Sayaret Matkal, Sargento Camila Feliciano, Spanish Navy, FGNE, and finally, Maréchal de Logis Chef Théo Deschamps, French Gendarmerie, Jigan, complete with his issued old-school six-shot revolver. Here in the jungle, though, they wore no uniform, no rank or unit insignia, no name tags. They were clad in adaptive camouflage and moved in the shadows. Even without the wearing of ranks, though, they all knew the chain of command. Ferris was the commander. By rank, Bowen would be his second, but her orders were more on the technical and sabotage side, so Mbeba stepped into that role. Beyond that, everyone put it out of their mind as something to worry about, only if and when the shit hit the fan. Eight hours later, they were within sight of the clearing around the outpost. Carter climbed a tree to get a better view. From his perch in the orange-red canopy, he drew out a map and shared it with the team's HUDs. Scrambling back down, he discovered red stains on his boots and trousers. Looks like the trees like to leave their mark, he said. At least there's no jimpy gimpy here. Orlovska shuddered. I went to Queensland, and the back of my hand touched one of those. It's like acid and electricity at the same time. They sat down and looked over the map, Ferris building a plan. The clearing you saw behind us there, that's a good spot for our collabs to rally for pickups. This area here, he said, enlarging a portion of the map, should be a good place to lay an ambush for a patrol. If we don't get one tonight, we proceed on the initial plan to take the comm tower. And when we do succeed, Mbeba said, we see what kind of intel we get and go from there. The seal is so sure of herself, Deschamps said. Very well then, we will get a patrol. Alive. Feliciano tilted her head. Why is a French cop here anyway? Deschamps shrugged and Bowen stepped to his defense. I've worked with these chaps in Somalia, she said, and they are definitely not just cops. Ferris turned to Deschamps. Speaking of cops, do you have proper ammo for that relic on your hip? No, not for this mission. Only ammo for the carbine, he said, holding his up. But this is no relic. They are still making the MR-73. The ambush and capture of a scout patrol was anticlimactic at best. A single soldier armed only with a baton, 
walking through the edges of the jungle just outside the clearing. His four feet stamped and crashed through the well-worn trails as he swatted branches away with his baton. His six-digit hand gripped the baton so tight, his grey-brown leathery skin turned pale around his fingers. When a hand covered his mouth and the unmistakable barrel of a rifle poked in his back, he deflated. Rather than give him time to sound an alarm, they promptly gagged him and marched him to the other clearing two kilometres away. They stripped him of his communicator and quickly worked out how to turn on the global positioning. They were further thrilled to find maps that outlined the current positions of their forces, including the field headquarters. After a short round of questioning, mostly about how to read the maps and GPS, Ferris said, Mbeba, call the van, have him picked up. Mbeba radioed to their Xeno accomplices who landed a low-terrain flyer in the clearing. The six-limbed soldier was bundled aboard by others of his kind and given a hot meal. The female at the door said, Thirty of your hours. Ferris nodded. It won't last that long. As the flyer left, they scrambled back through the jungle to a secondary rally point, away from where they'd taken the scout and the clearing. We have to stop the ship taking off. The first thought was to take the outpost and knock out the comm tower, but the ship is at the field HQ, less than ten clicks from here. Are you saying what I think you are, mate? asked Carter. I like it, Orlovska said. We can use the cravat to cover our movements in the morning, or create a diversion. Right. Sun comes up, little bugger screams, Bowen said. I think with this comm device we can see where everyone is too. I'll do a little digging to see if I can turn off its own location announcement. Shit, is it doing that now? Mbeba asked. You think I'm daft? It's in a Faraday bag. Bowen, you've got thirty minutes. If you can't do it in that time, we'll just have to chance it, Ferris said. The rest of you use your UV lights and look for more cavat. The more, the merrier. Thirty minutes later, they'd collected three more cavat. Bowen said she hadn't managed to completely disable the device's location announcement, but had scrambled it enough that it would be nothing but confusing for anyone trying to lock onto it. Using the device, they found a road through the jungle to the HQ and were able to hide at the sides before vehicles travelling back and forth on it were within sight. They still had a couple hours of darkness left when they placed Kavat in a semicircle around the front side of the compound, along with a remote flashbang by the side of the road. Continuing around the large clearing, they moved to the opposite side of the HQ and up to the fence. There were no guards or patrols in this area, giving them easy access to take their time cutting their way in. They snuck in the fence and hid among the storage containers, using the device to tell when a soldier was coming near. Ferris decided that Bowen should take the device and move toward the ship to begin her sabotage. Deschamps nabbed one of the guards and quickly bound and gagged him, taking his comm device and rifle. "'Is a little heavy,' he said, "'but I think I like it.' "'Ferris,' Bowen radioed, "'I'm in place. Sun's coming up, should hit the tree line in a minute. Roger.' When the rays of the sun hit the edges of the jungle, three things happened in quick succession. The Kovat began screaming, eliciting annoyance from the Xeno soldiers. A flash bang went off, and a Xeno weapon began firing toward the tree line. That was all it took to pull all the soldiers to the front of the compound, firing wildly into the trees. Bowen moved to the ship unchallenged and removed the launch controller. We're good, she radioed, coming back to you. The sudden hail of fire into their backs stopped the soldiers from firing into the trees, but none could turn around fast enough to get a shot off. A loud alarm blared, and all weapons were silenced. A flyer landed just outside the compound, and three of the six-limbed creatures, dressed all in white, walked into the compound, leading the soldier they'd captured the night before. The one in charge walked down the row of disgraced soldiers, looking at the purple paint marks on their backs. Only one had turned around far enough to be painted in the chest. Bowen dangled the launch controller from her finger while Deschamps unbound the sentry he'd disabled and returned his weapon to him. Better luck next time, huh? The leader of the three Xenos in white motioned for the commander and the humans to approach. The red team has taken the flag, she said. Group leader Grishin, allow me to introduce you to Major Ferris from Earth. The commander stepped forward and bowed her head slightly. Thank you, Arbiter Hisline. Major, it is an honour to meet you. I apologise for our poor showing this day. No, 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 he said. None of that. 
Everyone starts somewhere. Now we know where you are and we can work on finding the training methods that get you where you need to be. Assuming, Carter said, that the stuffed shirts and eggheads can blow enough smoke up each other's asses. The group leader looked at Carter with her large black eyes. The what? Blowing what? I'm not sure my translator is working. Mbeba stepped forward. Chief Petty Officer Mbeba, ma'am. What Sergeant Carter was trying to say is that as long as our diplomats and scientists can work out an agreement, we can devise training for your people based on our warfare doctrine. His line raised a six-digit hand to get their attention. I am to understand that the eight of you only met on the flight here. That's right, ma'am, Ferris said. We all come from different services in different countries for the most part, but our training is all very similar. And by training us, Grishin said, we would be able to work as seamlessly with humans. Indeed, ma'am, indeed, Ferris said.